Okay. okay, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you all for joining us for today's A Month of Service presentation. Uh, we are providing services for you today regarding disaster readiness and planning ahead. My name is Nia Murray. I am Programs Coordinator with Neighborhood Recovery Community Development Corporation. And we are one of the partners in the A Month of Service collaboration. Basically what a month of service is, is a collaboration of these eight different organizations, including Neighborhood Recovery, Lone Star Legal Aid is one of our presenting partners today, uh, the City of Houston's Department of Neighborhoods, um, Harris County Appraisal District, Harris County, County Tax Assessor Collector's Office, the Earl Carl Institute, Houston Volunteer Lawyers, and the Houston Bar Association. And I hope I did not forget anybody. Uh, typically my cohort, uh, Ms. Myra Hippolyte, with the City of Houston Department of Neighborhood uh, is joining us for the presentations, but she's a little bit under the weather today. So we're, we're extending her well wishes and, uh, and a speedy recovery. So, uh, but a month of service is a collaboration of these eight different organizations that we come together on a monthly basis to offer a variety of workshops relative to uh, uh, community empowerment, to asset building, asset protection, and maintaining of generational wealth. So we used to go out into the community and offer these services or offer our workshops in person. But of course, due to COVID, we've had to adapt and adjust and offer them on a virtual basis. However, this platform has allowed us the opportunity to uh, extend the services, expand our workshop and uh, reach an even greater, large, greater audience um, you know, throughout the city of Houston, throughout Harris County, surrounding counties, throughout the state of Texas, and even across the U.S. for folks, you know, that, that have heard about our workshop. So, so this is, it's kind of been a blessing in disguise for us, uh, in other words. So, um, but we've continued to, again, to expand our programs, um, our topics, based on the feedback that we receive from the community, what they'd like to hear. Um, but we, we, we pretty much do these because one, we came together, we wanted to, to create a larger impact to reach more people. And two, we wanted to, to make sure that we are servicing the people in the community that actually need to receive this information. There are a lot of folks that don't know where to go, don't know who to ask or where to even start when it comes to finding resources that are available to them at, that, at a, that are either at no cost or low, at no charge. So, and with, uh, with, does that, with hurricane season uh, upon us, um, we, we know that it's beneficial to get information out to the community about what can be done to prepare uh, in advance of a disaster. Uh, most people automatically think when they, when they hear disaster, they think just hurricane and hurricane season. But the fact is a disaster can happen at any time. Um, COVID technically was a disaster. Winter storm Uri last year was a disaster. Uh, untimely death is a disaster, a fire, what have you. And uh, people don't uh, generally prepare well enough in advance for, uh, for some type of a disaster. So we're here to provide you with some information about what you can do to, to plan and to prepare ahead, especially for our seniors that are out there um, that are on fixed or limited incomes that um, you know, don't have a whole lot of family members or what have you that can assist in, in that capacity. So we're here for you uh, for that. So um, without further ado, oh, information that it is provided here today, I wanna say uh, is for educational purposes only. It is not considered to be professional or legal advice. You will be hearing information from our partners with Lone Star Legal Aid in regards to um, FEMA or insurance claims and what that process is like and filing those types of disputes or appeals when it comes to those claims. So um, again, it's not legal advice. However, if you all find yourselves in need of any kind of legal, uh, civil legal service, we do encourage you to reach out to our legal service partners like Lone Star. Um, and in addition to that, the services that are offered by RSVP of Southeast, oh, Texas, it's not Southeast Houston, my apologies, Southeast Texas. Um, we ask that you guys to be as interactive as you like to uh, possibly be, ask whatever questions that you'd like. However, please keep in mind that uh, we are streaming live on our social media platform, as well as this session is being recorded so that we can send out this presentation for everyone to go back to view again or to share with other people that may find this information to be beneficial. So, um, so when you're asking your questions, we try to 
keep them to be as general as you possibly can and not give too much personal detail information because we don't want your uh, your your personal information getting out there uh, is you know like that so uh, with that being said I'd like for us to go ahead and introduce our partners uh, we will go right on into the presentations and we will have our question and answer following the presentation so uh, Sapna would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself Hello, Hi, I'm sorry. Sorry, I think we're okay. So um, I'm Sapna Iyer with Lone Star Legal Aid, and I'm here with Amanda Bosley, also with Lone Star Legal Aid, and she's the manager of our disaster team. Okay, great. Um, um, Mr. Thomas Call with uh, RSVP of Southeast Texas. Please go ahead and introduce yourself, and you can move right on into your presentation. Okay, good. Yes, my name is uh, Thomas Call, and I'm a volunteer. I'm retired and uh, I've been working with uh, RSVP of Southeast Texas now since I did retire, which was back in uh, 2015. And so the presentation today is going to be on disaster preparedness. It's one of the presentations we do. We also do presentations on senior Medicare fraud, on identity theft, can you tell the folks briefly what RSVP is? Uh, well, Mary Ann says that RSVP stands for Retired Senior, Retired Sexy Volunteer Program. <laughs> retired Senior Volunteer Program. <laughs> so that's one of her little phrases that she likes to play with. Uh, Mary Ann Kelly, she's my coordinator. And so she sends me out on various missions. We do things together. Uh, we also do senior fairs. We'll do health fairs and a variety of other projects. But of course, with COVID, that has uh, limited a lot of what we do do. So we're just starting, starting to do in-person presentations again, although we still do Zoom or WebEx once in a while. But it's, you know, it takes time. But today I'm going to be talking about disaster preparation. <clears throat> so climate change, you know, we all hear about climate change. There was a debate about the effects. Is there really climate change? But whatever you believe or feel, there are things that are going on. Like Texas had that cold snap that knocked out power. That, that uh, storm we had a couple of years ago killed more than 200 people most from hypothermia, and almost all of those deaths were preventable, but we weren't prepared for it. We have an average of 145 tornadoes that sweep through the United States each year so between we January and March. Five of the last six seasons have been above the average with 218 twisters hitting in those three months last year. Uh, so Texas also has tornadoes, as we are well aware, although Houston doesn't have that many. In 2022, flash floods in, tech, in Tennessee killed six people, wiping out dozens of homes. And we just recently have had Yellowstone National Park with the most recent flooding. And flash floods are something we live with even in Houston. We all know when we get a massive amount of rain in a very short period of time, flash floods occur. Uh, the coin, I'm not in Texas, Kansas anymore, tornadoes occur. Tornadoes happen in Texas. They, of course, occur in Tornado Alley. They can be deceptive because they can occur at night. Luckily, the National Weather Service now has systems that will predict and not only predict, but can see tornadoes that are approaching areas and emergency situations can be brought to bear in order to protect those individuals. Uh, the biggest threat from tornadoes, obviously, is debris, stuff that's flying around at home. Avoid the windows. You use a very small, simply located room that's protected. If you're in a vehicle, try and drive away from the tornado if you can. If you can't, park the vehicle out of the traffic lanes, seek shelter, keep your seatbelt on, remain in your car. Uh, if you're stuck outside in the open, get away. Go, go look for a depression, something that is the lowest point that you can find. Um, Tom, I don't mean to interrupt you. Are you, are you looking at your presentation right now? Yeah. 
You, you do your screen share. Oh, I'm not screen sharing. Okay. No. Let me see. Da, 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 da. Bear with us for just a moment. Do you hear the share screen button? Sorry about that. Yep, there it goes. Obviously, I, I'm not a professional at this. <laughs> That's okay, neither are we, we're still learning. So go right ahead. Okay, if you're caught in a phase flood, uh, no matter what the size of the vehicle, the problem is with the vehicles. I know that some on my screen. Can everyone see the full screen? Yes. Okay. No matter what the size of the vehicle, if it comes over halfway up your tires, you're already committed. You know, you, you have to either climb out the window if the vehicle starts being swept away and you know the flood waters try and get out of it and try and get away from that that flood location stay in the vehicle for as long as you can the most important thing is don't drive into flood waters you know that they had the, that famous phrase um or what is it called turn and around don't drown turn around don't drown turn around don't drown turn around yeah. don't drown there, there was a very unfortunate example of that when we had massive uh, flash floods and on West Park Drive, there's a part of West Park Drive as it comes to an end, it really goes down before it comes back up. And someone was going into work, it was dark outside, she drove right into like 20 feet of water and drowned. And so it was so unfortunate. So to just turn around. It's not worth your life. There's also uh, participation in the first Tuesday, which is the neighborhood projects. Be aware of your surroundings at all times. Know your neighbors. Uh, have a phone tree that you can share disaster information with your neighbors. 95% uh, of all emergencies, the first individuals who are there are not the first responders. They're the neighbors, they're people that you might know, they could be family members. They are the first to be there that really intercede and maybe be of help. Communication, you know, know the phone numbers, keep up to date with everything. Uh, decide if you're going to decide if you're going to stay or leave before an emergency hits. Uh, and make sure you have the proper insurance. That's very important. Annual registration, there's a lot of information for a STEER 211. Individuals that need with access and functional needs, it's called the State of Texas Emergency Assistant Registry. Have your ID for information, develop a support system for individuals you trust. Make a list of all the tasks performed during the day. List all your medications, allergies, doctor's information, personal items, make plans in advance for service animals and leave a wheelchair behind and bring a seat cushion if you have to evacuate. Again, family communication plans. Every family is unique. Consider their needs. Consider that the fact if you have children, what are the ages of the children? A lot of children, if they're very young, may not know you other than mommy or daddy. Make sure that they know your name that they have that con con contact information. Keep a list of contact by phone. Keep that in the emergency kit. Be sure to have extra phone chargers. You know, we live in a world of electronic connectivity. Who has a battery power powered up, a battery powered radio anymore? That, that's an important thing to have in a hurricane because if all the power goes out, that radio that you might have 
and you should have as part of the kit that you should keep, will keep you in contact with emergency frequency stations or stations who can provide information about what's going on. So we have to remember with, with this kind of connectivity we have now, once the power is out, you're, you're, you're isolated to a great extent. So have uh, conditions or have plans in effect that will alleviate that. Find a safe place in the home for shelter. Best escape routes from your home. Pick a relative or friend for your contact. Then if you have pets, pets have need special needs also. I think it was during Ike. Um, when I get here in Houston, we lost power for days. I couldn't call anyone, but for whatever reason, I could text them. So texts work. For whatever reason, the phones didn't work as far as calling someone, but when I tried to text individuals, it worked. So remember that. Caring for animals, don't leave us behind. Keep identification, equipment, supplies. If there are elderly pets, if there's medical information that might be relevant, you don't want a pet running around, you know, unleashed. So make sure that there's a leash or a carrier or some way to protect that animal along with food. There are two kits when you have uh, natural disasters that basically force us to either evacuate or stay put. We have the build at home stay kit, which is shelter in place. It's good for about five to seven days. It involves water, non-perishable foods, battery, as I mentioned for a radio, weather radio with uh, Loan alert, flashlights, first aid kits, whistles. There's a variety of things here. And in fact, you can buy backpacks that have all of these supplies within them. But this is something that you just get a tub and make sure that you have those items in that tub and refresh it every once in a while, like every six months. Go in and just check and make sure. Uh, unique family needs, again, okay, it says six months, review every six months. Ring gear, cash, credit cards aren't going to work. So cash, traveler's checks, those are king. Fire extinguisher, mat matches in a waterproof tin, a disinfectant. Family documents, such as uh, driver's licenses, make copies of your driver's licenses, copy of insurance policies, keep them in a waterproof container. And then you have a to-go bag. And that's if you have to leave, Make sure you have copies of important documents and papers, an extra set of car house keys, some extra mobile charger, copies of your credit ATM cards, water snacks, energy bars, first aid kit, flashlight, whistle, a list of medications. Like I have medications I'm taking now at this point in my life. So I better have a list of those medications if I have to evacuate. Toothpaste and toothbrushes, uh, cleaning supplies, Contact and meeting place information. That's very important for family members. If I have to evacuate, it's good if I have a communication plan with family members, we're going to be at the spot. When I was working and we would have a, a drill and it would be like an evacuation in the case of a fire in the building or some kind of natural disaster, we had a meeting place that we were going to meet at the gas station down the block or at the park down the block. So we knew, all the employees knew, that's where you go. That's where you try and go. So contact and meeting place information is very important. Rain ponchos, obviously, if there's rain, you have a separate backpack pack for your kid, change of clothes. And always be aware of the potential for exhaustion. So you want to be able to have a plenty of clean water, fluids, Eat well, wear sturdy work boots and gloves, wash your hands thoroughly when working in debris. Volunteer organizations to know if a natural disaster occurs is United Way, the Salvation Army, the Red Cross, Baptist Men, CERT, and I wish I knew what that stood for, Jewish Disaster Response Corps, and local agencies. Stay informed. And this is where that radio, uh, battery operated radio comes into play. 
Stay informed before, during, and after disasters with the emergency alert system broadcasts that are activated by local authorities at KTRH and KUAHF. Find links to more news and weather resources. Go to readyhoustontexas.org and www.ready.gov. And after a disaster, contact your insurance company immediately. You have to have be filed with your insurance company before FEMA will consider you for a loan. So you can complete the FEMA online disaster application. And we're having a, someone from FEMA, I think, also talking. So I'm sure they will reiterate this too. Or you can call FEMA. Public health threats. And there are a lot of them right now. We, we've been dealing with uh, COVID since 2019 or so. And in fact, you're looking at someone who played COVID dodgeball for two and a half years. Three weeks ago, I caught COVID. So I got the variant out there that's very infectious. Luckily, I have mild symptoms, but my, my uh, time of playing COVID dodgeball came to an end. <laughs> so, and I talked to my doctor and she said, Tom, you know, everyone's gonna catch this sooner or later. It's lucky you got a mild case. So it does have an impact. Symptoms of the flu, sudden fever, headache, tiredness, dry cough, preventing the flu. And there's a misconception, like when, when I told my friends who were not vaccinated, saying, see, see, you were vaccinated and you caught COVID. You know, the fact of the matter is I'm a scientist. I was a scientist for much of my adult life. Vaccines do not prevent you from catching anything. But if you catch it, they mitigate the severity of the illness. That's what they do. That's the fact. Anything else you hear is misinformation. So vaccinations, washing your hands, covering a cough, and disinfecting surfaces. surfaces. And an unfortunate thing that it seems like we have more and more of now, and it's at a red alert that's on a red flag stage as far as uh, congressional leaders are concerned and legislatures are concerned, it's mass shootings. And just like Uvalde, a tragedy that, you know, it's almost, it's unspeakable. But if it happens, you have three things that you can do. The first is to get out of there, run. If you can separate yourself from an active shooter, do so. The second is to hide. If you are in a room that you know that shooter is in the vicinity and there's no way to run, hide as best you can. And the last resort is cause a disruption, distract that individual, fight. Because with that action, it can distract that person to an extent where he could be, he or she could be disabled. So it's, it's just something that we have to, that we're dealing with now. There's a number here to report suspicious activity, call 1-855.i.watch4 uh, or visit iwatchhouston.org. If it's an emergency, obviously, if it's an emergency, dial 911. When you are in immediate danger, dial 911. Steer, as you mentioned, which is basically to register yourself if you need access, if you need help, say if you're home alone, if you're disabled, is 211 to register so they know where you are. Non-emergency is 713-884-3131. Center Point Energy, 800-332-7143. Um, and there's a, if there's digging involved and, and you might hit power, power uh, submerged power cables and that kind of stuff, 811, uh, non-emergency information is 311. And are you better prepared? You know, hopefully this has helped you a little bit. It's a Cliff Notes version, as I've mentioned, uh, a very sort of morbid ending point that, that we use if you're asked to evacuate and you don't listen, 
be sure to use a black Sharpie and write your social security number on your arm so you could be identified. That's sort of a quite a morbid phrase, but I mean, when we had Ike that destroyed I, the islands, some of the outer islands in Galveston, people died because they didn't evacuate. So that does it for me. So I, I hope you did gain something for this. Um, just let me know and I'll, I'll hand it back to Nia. All right. Thank you very much, Todd, uh, for, for that wonderful information and those tips. Um, if anyone does have any questions of time, please feel free to type them in the chat or uh, at the end of the presentation, you can unmute yourself and ask your questions directly. Uh, but at this time, we're going to move right on into our uh, other portion of our presentation. And we're going to have Ms. Sapna and uh, Amanda with Lone Star Legal Aid. Um, Tom, can I get you to stop? Yeah. Screen uh, yeah, screen sharing, please. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Uh, I can do it. Hold on. Okay, okay. There you go. Thank you. Okay, I mean, ready? you ready, Sam? Okay, I'm ready. Um, so, hello again, everyone. Our portion of the presentation on disaster readiness will focus on the basics of FEMA assistance and also insurance. Um, hurricane season has already started and it runs through November 30th, so now is the time to be preparing if you haven't already prepared. So, uh, let's get started so you can be disaster ready. Uh, so here is our agenda or what we'll be talking about today. So let's start with blue skies. This is what we're calling the time before a disaster when we should really be getting our affairs in order and preparing for the next disaster. And then I will go over some FEMA basics and Sapna is going to go over the insurance basics and then we'll give you the takeaways or the most important information we covered, and then a few resources. So blue skies. Let's talk about real property, uh, personal property, and general preparation. So for rental property, this is your house and land. Um, starting with flood insurance, SAPNA will discuss a little bit more in detail, but uh, most people have homeowner's insurance, but you don't realize that it doesn't cover uh, flood damage caused from a natural disaster. And if you're watching this presentation, you should probably have flood insurance because you live in Southeast Texas. Um, another protection is homeowner's insurance, which like I said, most of you probably already have. Uh, clear <clears throat> drainage systems, gutters, and French drains at your own property. But you should walk the streets and those big gutters you see in the middle of the street uh, on the curb or almost always at the corner, those need cleaning too. Um, if there's a lot of dirt and muck piled on the side of your street, that's gonna flow in floodwaters and end up in those drains and it will flood your street and possibly your home. So if you're able to, uh, you should check those out every now and then and try to clean them out, especially if there's a storm coming. Uh, secure anything that can fly around or damage your property and then uh, clear title issues if applicable. Uh, in order to get certain types of assistance after a flood, including FEMA assistance, you'll need to prove that you own your home. So it's good to work on getting the home into your name or getting something on file with the property record showing that you have an ownership interest in the property prior to the next disaster so you aren't delayed further after you apply for FEMA or for grants from other organizations. And for personal property, these are your things like furniture, jewelry, your car is included in this. Uh, car insurance, Sapna will elaborate on car insurance. So I'm gonna leave that for her. Uh, secure any loose property. Make sure that your homeowner's insurance covers contents and renter's insurance. If you are a renter, you need to get insurance to cover the contents of your apartment or home that you are renting. And you will need to get renter's flood insurance to cover contents that may be damaged in a flood. 
Uh, finally, during blue skies, you should prepare. Make a disaster kit, uh, medication, gas, flashlights, pet supplies, batteries, phone chargers, etc. Um, Thomas already uh, touched on that in his presentation. He had a good list going. So um, you can also check out, uh, go to ready.gov for more prep and info for a, uh, for a kit list. Plan an escape route. Fill your tank and air your tires. Gather shelter and place supplies like bread, peanut butter, water, and other non-perishables. Scan and download important documents to the cloud uh, like insurance and title records and inventory your belongings. Now let's talk about FEMA. So right after disaster, this is the process of how FEMA comes about. The governor uh, will request a disaster declaration then the president will make a federal disaster declaration. FEMA assistance becomes available and the application process opens up. So you will apply for assistance if you need it. FEMA will send, then send out an inspector to inspect the damaged property. And uh, during COVID-19, those have been uh, virtual. And then FEMA will make a decision and the appeals uh, period will come after that. Then after all said and done, uh, there will be a possible recoupment period. Uh, after you've received assistance, FEMA can come back and ask you for proof that you spent the money on what it was intended for, or that you didn't get uh, a duplication of benefits, meaning you got insurance proceeds that covered all of the loss, and then you also got FEMA assistance. So just be aware to keep your receipts and know that you have to spend the money on what it was intended for. Uh, the application process, as soon as you can after the disaster declaration, apply. Uh, you can do this online or on the FEMA app on your smartphone or by calling FEMA. Possibly the best way to apply is in person at a disaster recovery center or DRC. Um, you, can get, uh, you can get to see a FEMA rep and also there are other types of assistance and agents at the DRC that can help you. Uh, there is a 60 day deadline to apply. So you only have 60 days to apply from the date of the disaster declaration, the one that is made by the president. Sometimes this is extended if the disaster is substantial. So FEMA uh, provides assistance for home repair and also for personal property replacement. Uh, for real property, this helps with repairs to the home that you own. It will not fix all of the damage. It will not cover repairs covered by other sources. Like if you have insurance and it covers the entire loss, FEMA is not going to also give you the money. Uh, FEMA, once FEMA money is received, you must obtain flood insurance. If you receive FEMA assistance at your property, you must maintain flood insurance on that property forever to be eligible for future assistance from FEMA. And this uh, amount is subject to statutory caps. So the amount changes yearly due to inflation. And there is a cap on the amount of FEMA assistance a person can receive. If you are a renter, you may qualify for rental assistance if your apartment is uninhabitable, meaning that FEMA will pay you to rent another place or stay in a hotel while your apartment is being repaired. Uh, for personal property, you will have to apply uh, with the Small Business Administration or the SBA before FEMA will uh, be approved. This is not just for businesses, it's for people also. The SBA provides low interest loans to people who qualify and FEMA will not provide assistance for certain things without you first having applied uh, for the SBA loan. In Texas, uh, this type of assistance, the personal property assistance, is administered by the state through the Health and Human Services Commission. It covers items that were lost in the flood, and it will not replace all of your items. For instance, if you had a luxury rug or a flat screen TV, FEMA only replaces items that they consider necessary to live. And then this is also subject to statutory caps. Um, it's the same amount as the home repair assistance, but it's a separate pot of money. So there are two caps that you can receive, one for home repair assistance and one for personal property assistance. Some other types of assistance that are possible after a disaster are funeral assistance. 
FEMA will cover the costs of a funeral if you can prove that the death was a result of the disaster. Um, unemployment, you may, be, you may qualify if you lived in a disaster area and lost your job because of it. Disaster food stamps may be available after a disaster to people who experienced a loss of income or have other disaster related expenses and meet certain income limits. Also, you must not have been getting regular SNAP food benefits at the time of the disaster. Anyone who's receiving regular SNAP may be eligible for food stamp replacement, but that is separate from disaster SNAP. Uh, FEMA also will provide crisis counseling and critical needs. Uh, this is a one-time assistance provided by FEMA immediately after the disaster in the amount of $500. Okay, so finally, I'm going to talk about the FEMA appeal process before SAPMA gets to insurance. Um, so the appeals process, check your application status, review the method of communication that you approved and make sure to check that source via phone, email, text, snail mail, whatever you choose on your application, that's how FEMA is going to send you the decision and ask you for more information. So make sure you're checking whatever you checked on the application. Uh, review your FEMA letter. If you're happy with the decision, there's no need to appeal. If you are denied or you don't think you received the amount necessary to fix your property, then write an appeal to FEMA or reach out to us at Lone Star Legal Aid to possibly assist with doing an appeal on your behalf. Just remember the amount provided by FEMA is to make your home habitable, not to make the home the same or better than it was prior to the disaster. Uh, you have 60 days from the date of the letter to file an appeal with FEMA. And sometimes this is extended. Um, send in one single appeal for both your real property and your personal property. FEMA will send your personal property appeal to the state. Uh, like I said before, personal property is handled by the state, but FEMA will forward the information to the state to review. Uh, what to send in. Document everything. Mold, mildew, rubble, flood damage. Send pictures. Uh, submit your own estimates for repairs. Your own contractor's bid with estimates and with contact information. Uh, FEMA will call the contractor to confirm if they need to. Uh, for cars, your mechanic must indicate that the damage was caused by the flood water and include their contact information too. If FEMA did not pay you for your uh, for work you already did, submit your receipts. This would be for mold removal and cleanup immediately following the disaster, possibly. Uh, FEMA sent me money. You must use the money in the way FEMA told you to use it. You do not get to substitute your judgment for FEMA's judgment. Uh, FEMA can and will and has request proof of how you use the money. If you don't use the money for what you're supposed to, FEMA can recoup those funds. Um, and now I will turn it over to Sapna to discuss the wonders of insurance. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna basically touch upon the three kind of insurance categories. And I think most people kind of think about two of them and leave out the third one. So homeowner's insurance is probably what most people think about when they think about insurance. This is your, your regular insurance, right? If you have a mortgage, this is the insurance your mortgage company says that you have to get. Um, and it's, it's through any insurance carrier, right? So whatever insurance you use, whether it's Geico or Allstate or Nationwide or whoever it is, um, this is any of the big insurance companies that you use when people think of insurance, Typically, this is what they're thinking about when they're talking about their home. So you have dwelling coverage and you have personal property coverage. The dwelling coverage is gonna, what, is gonna be what pays for damage to your actual building, like your actual home, you know, your foundation, your drywall, your roof, all of that kind of stuff. As long as what you are looking to get help on is a covered peril, that's a, a key term. Your insurance company is a contract, right? And it's, it's a, it's a contract between you and a company and your policy tells you what they're going to help you fix and what they're not. So you have to make sure that you're submitting for a covered pearl. peril. Sorry, Personal property is the stuff inside your home. Um, so for a lot of people with winter storm URI, this was the pipes bursting in the roof, right? When they, when they froze and then when the water comes gushing in, 
the water comes flooding out and the inside of the house gets trashed, right? Your furniture, your carpet, your television, all of that kind of stuff. Again, as long as it is a covered peril, you know, you should be able to get help replacing that stuff. If you are a renter, I strongly suggest you get renter's insurance because you're not going to be covered by the insurance policy your landlord has on the building. So if you want to be covered for your stuff, you need to get your own policy. Okay, flood insurance. This I think is what most people don't think about. Flood damage is not covered by a standard homeowner's insurance policy. And it's a little tricky because they will do what's called a named storm cover, right? Where you have typically a 2% deductible. But if it's, if it's a flood, it's the water coming up from the ground. Um, that's a flood and they are not going to cover that. So for those of you guys who are here with Harvey, a lot of times you had two different policies kicking in, right? You had the rain coming in on your roof and maybe your roof leaked and you had water dripping in from your ceiling. Well, that's from, this, that's from the rain coming from the top. But if you were in one of those places in the city where the water flooded and it had nowhere to go and you could watch the water rising and then slowly hitting you know, your driveway and then hitting your stoop and then coming into the house, that is flood damage. And a regular homeowner's insurance policy does not cover flood damage. So if you live in Houston, <laughs> like Amanda said, if you live anywhere kind of in this region, and if you can afford it, that's the other piece, flood insurance can be quite expensive, um, strongly recommend that you get it. Um, now flood insurance, you purchase it through your insurance company, but you really don't because FEMA and the National Flood Insurance Program, it's a federal program and all insurance policies that come out of that program are the same. So it's not like with your private insurance where you can kind of pick and match and get what you want. The flood insurance policies are the flood insurance policies depending on where you live, which is part of what is key. Um, if you have already received FEMA insurance and you are in a flood zone, you have to get flood insurance in order to get any kind of FEMA assistance again. FEMA is a one-off. If you do not get flood insurance, they will not help you. And importantly, this assistance attaches to the home. You guys, it doesn't attach to you. So your home might have flooded 15 years ago when you didn't own it, but FEMA has record of that flooding and you are going to be stuck because your home has already received flood insurance. So if you are purchasing a home, make sure you ask if the house is ever flooded because if the answer is yes, you're going to want to want you're going to want to purchase flood insurance. If you're a renter, you need to get specialized renters flood insurance. That is a very separate thing than regular renters insurance. And then I put the website on here for anyone who wants to look. So the other kind of insurance that most people think about is car insurance. Um, Texas only requires liability insurance, but the kicker is that liability insurance is not gonna fix your car after a flood, right? Everyone knows that liability insurance is when you hit somebody and it protects the other driver, but it's not going to protect you. And if your car gets flooded out, then you are going to be responsible for it. So in order to get your car repaired or replaced, uh, to get a rental car, you're going to need to get comprehensive car insurance, which again can be cost prohibitive. If your car took on water, the odds are it's going to be totaled out. Um, flood water is dirty water, it's heavy water, and it will destroy your engine. Okay, so the typical insurance process. File a claim with your insurance company as soon as you possibly can. Um, your policy will say that you have a responsibility of letting them know as soon as you possibly can. You have to file a claim with your regular insurance company. And if you have flood insurance, you file one with your flood insurance company. They are two separate claims that you have to file. Keep a copy of everything you give to any adjuster. That's just a, a general rule anyway. You should always keep a copy of everything that you give to anybody in life ever, but especially when you're dealing with the contracts or insurance, your home, make sure you keep a copy of everything. Do what you can to mitigate your damages. Um, Texas is a mitigation of damages state. Basically what that means is if you have any way of limiting the amount of damage you are supposed to do it. 
So, um, you know, if you've had a flooding toilet, most people know that you can reach, you know, behind the toilet and turn the water off and you do that. So your bathroom doesn't flood, right? Well, it's the same concept. So if you've got flooding and you've got drywall that was totally soaked, there is mold and mildew growing behind that drywall in your insulation. Take it out, put it on the curb, put it away from where you are living, but don't breathe it in. Um, and don't leave it there because it will, it will sneak up your entire wall into any pieces of your wall. So this is what mitigation is. Pull it out, muck it out. If you need to get a blue top, you cover, you know, the part of your roof that's leaking if you can. And then you save whatever you can save so that when the adjusters come out and the inspectors come out, it's all sitting there. Um, Obviously, you don't want to get sick, you don't want to have hazardous material, but to the extent that you can keep it on your property away from yourself, you want to keep it so people can inspect it. Here is a PDF link that I threw in there about mold. Mold is hazardous to your health, so if you're going to clean it, if you're in that situation, make sure you read this, pull it, read through it. You're going to want to wear a mask, you're going to need equipment, um, those spores can make you really sick. Don't clean your car. Don't use it either. <laughs> um, I know that's really hard for a lot of people because you have to get to and from work. But again, flood water is dirty. It is heavy water. It will destroy your engine. You're also going to want to let anybody from an insurance company look at your car. They're going to want to see the grime line. Um, and for anyone who's been through a flood, you know what I'm talking about, right? Where the water gets up to a certain point, And then when it starts to recede, everything under that is it's just nasty. There's dirt and there's debris and there's slime and um, you're going to want them to be able to see it. If your engine got wet, if any part of anything under your, under your trunk, now under your hood got wet, um, Thomas was talking about the water getting up, you know, halfway through your tires. Well, that's about where your undercarriage starts, right? And especially nowadays, I mean, our cars are basically driving computers. So if any of that stuff got wet, before you even think about turning your engine on, you need to make sure it is absolutely 100% dry. And the complicated part is that you cannot see the inside, right? I don't know about your car, but my car has got this big protective metallic cap thing on top of it. And I have no idea what's going on in that engine. Okay, flood insurance. Again, you're gonna wanna re um, report immediately. You can ask them for flood insurance about advance payments, depending on your policy for your regular insurance, they might have that as well. You have to file what's called a proof of loss form. And I put the uh, link here, you have 60 days to do that. You'll probably have noticed a trend you guys with FEMA kind of 60 is the, the big number for all things FEMA. Um, if part of your claim has been denied, you can talk to your adjuster you can ask for additional payment. You can get your own adjuster. You can also, you also have the option of filing an appeal directly with FEMA. Um, you cannot do both though, okay? If you get an appraisal appeal, um, you cannot also file an appeal with FEMA. So it's either or. You do a separate appraisal or you file an appeal. And if you disagree still with everything that's going on, you have a year to file a lawsuit against the National Flood Insurance Program and what you were awarded. So I have just put this little infographic in here. When we get to the end, there's links on all of this stuff, but this is how to file your insurance claim. Homeowner's insurance policy, I cannot stress this enough. Read your policy, read your policy, read your policy. This is a contract between you and your insurance company. If your inspector comes back and you disagree with everything they have said, you can ask for another inspection. Most policies will let you get a second inspection. If they don't, you can hire your own adjuster to come out and look at your property, but this is something that you would have to pay for out of pocket. And then you can send that in to your insurance company and ask for um, more damages. Insurance companies are regulated by the Texas Department of Insurance, so you can file a complaint if you can't get your issue resolved, and here's the link for that. If you have windstorm insurance, you have to have very specific qualifications to get windstorm. Um, typically, it's when you've been denied coverage from any other insurance company for windstorm and hail. You have to be in a designated area, which in Texas is mostly the coast. But windstorm, they have their own ombudsman to handle complaints as well. Okay, so these are, these are our takeaways. 
If you don't have insurance yet, you should get it if it's within your budget to do so. Flood insurance can be really expensive. Homeowner's insurance is definitely expensive. Car insurance that is full comprehensive can be expensive, but if it's in your budget, it's worth doing it. Regular insurance is not going to cover floods. That is a big one. If you're a renter, make sure you get specific renter's insurance because whatever insurance the landlord has is not going to cover you. File any insurance claim with any company that you're filing it with immediately. Take lots of pictures of everything. I put in here more than you think you need, and I mean that. Um, you're going to want to get stuff that's perspective, right? So kind of far away. You're going to want to get stuff that's close up. If you are able to safely do it, take video of the water coming up from your floors. It's harrowing and it's awful, but it's also fantastic proof. Uh, gather any evidence that you can of damages to give to your insurance inspector. Make your house or apartment as safe as you can while also preserving everything that was destroyed so your insurance adjusters can look at it. It is a fine line. You don't wanna get sick. You don't wanna live in filth or mold or mildew, but at the same time, you want the people coming to your house to see how badly damaged it was. And then what I put in here was a pro tip. Um, if your power goes out, I should say when your powers go, power goes out, Unplug everything. I think a lot of people don't know to do this or they forget to do this. Turn off your HVAC because when the power comes back on, there is going to be a massive surge to your house. And if the reason your appliance doesn't work is because it's shorted out, because you forgot to unplug it, your insurance company is not going to pay for it. I have seen it happen. It's awful, awful, awful. So, um, I'm actually, when I moved here, someone actually told me that this was not something I knew. And what I have done at my house is every single appliance, everything is plugged into a, um, a surge protector, right? You guys all know what those, those long cords that turn off when there's a surge from the, so even if I forget, everything's connected to a surge protector. So if you haven't done that, um, I recommend buying surge protectors and uh, plugging everything into a surge protector so you don't even have to necessarily worry about it. Definitely turn off your air conditioner. If your air conditioner shorts out, replacing it is super crazy expensive. Repairing it is expensive. Um, as everyone knows, after disasters, there is a shortage of all sorts of supplies. You don't wanna be in that situation where you have to get your AC repaired and the parts that you need are not working or not available. Um, some resources here. The Legal Aid Disaster Resource Center, the National Disaster Legal Aid Resource Center, um, FloodSmart, and the Office of the Flood Insurance Advocate. These are just some great resources for you guys. And I think that's it. So let me stop sharing. We'll see if there's... Mia? Yes. Uh, Sapna, can you email me those resources so that I can send get those sent out to everybody? Of course. Okay. Uh, let me check the chat here to see if there were any questions. Uh, someone asked, how long does the power have to be off to consider unplugging everything? I don't think there's a certain... I don't honestly think there's a certain set time, right? Because if the power goes off, if it flickers, which that's different, but if your power actually goes out, when it comes on, it can surge back into your house. So um, I, I, I don't know like a set time. I can tell you what I do is when the power actually goes out, the first thing I do is run upstairs and turn off my air conditioner so that when it turns back on, I don't surge it out. Mm. Okay. Looking for other questions here to make sure that I caught everything. Let me ask about FEMA. I, I consider myself to be a little bit savvy, you know, technologically or otherwise. How, how does FEMA expect a senior citizen to navigate FEMA and apply? I mean, because I've seen so many people that, that have gotten denied because applications weren't completed correctly or you know something wasn't filled out or wasn't provided. And, and it just seems that you know so many people get so frustrated with trying to even apply for that assistance when they feel like they're just gonna get denied anyway. What do, what do, what do seniors do or what do they do in that, in that respect? 
Uh, what we try to do is tell them to, um, if possible, to rely on family and friends to help them. It's hard for just anybody to apply for FEMA and navigate FEMA, even attorneys. Um, so it's especially for uh, hard for the vulnerable community. And also at the disaster recovery centers are a great place to go because there are people there who can help them apply and uh, ask, you know, answer questions. Uh, the problem can be sometimes for the for the vulnerable community to actually get to the disaster center. Um, right. so always seems to be some sort of obstacle, but if if there are family, friends, neighbors, um, people who can help out, um, that's always the biggest help. You can still apply by phone. It's just, if you're going to do that, prepare to, to spend your entire day on the phone, right? Which is a whole other issue. That if you don't have technology and you don't have a way to get to a disaster recovery center, it might be that you are kind of stuck waiting on the phone. And does all FEMA, do all FEMA funds have to be paid back? Are they all considered loans or how does, what is that like? No, you don't pay back FEMA assistance. Uh, only time that they would ask for money back would be, um, like I had said about the duplication of benefits if you received assistance from insurance and, it, and it, insurance took care of everything and then you also got FEMA assistance, they might want that money back or, um, but, and then they also want you sometimes to prove that you actually spent it on what they gave you the money for. Like if they give you home repair assistance, don't buy a car with it type of thing. Do you have to claim claim the funds that you receive from FEMA on your taxes as like income? It's not, you don't have to claim it? No, it's not. FEMA, FEMA money is not, it's a grant. Um, the Small Business Administration, that is a loan. So that might be what you're thinking of. FEMA money is not a loan, but the SBA is a loan. So you do have to pay the SBA back. Okay. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. So it says, what entity will distribute the document bags? Oh, we actually have those those disaster bags that have like a checklist of little plastic bags. Is that what you're referring mm -hmm. to? Ms. Foreman, is that you? Yes, okay. And I believe RSVP has those disaster packets as well. Yes. Okay. Yes, we do have disaster packets that we can supply that has all kinds of material about who to contact, how to prepare, what to do, the different uh, types of disasters that, that you may face. So they have a lot of information in them. So if someone's interested in getting those from you guys, how do you, how do you uh, make contact or what are they, what's the process for getting those? Mary Ann Kelly. Okay. Contact Mary Ann Kelly. Okay, and I'll provide uh, RSVP's contact information in the email when I sent out the link also, Ms. Foreman. Yeah, so yeah you'll that have that. Cool. Yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, let's see, Dr. Babson, so purpose or no one brought it at the hurricane. Yeah, okay, so we'll make sure that you get those. Uh, let's see, how do I register a disabled person for rescue? You basically uh, dial 311, that's for STEER, and that will register individuals who need, need uh, help, who don't have access to getting out of their house, that kind of thing. 311 three, or 211? 211, I'm sorry, 211. 211, thank you. Okay. Uh, one ones. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. And Amanda just put the uh, link yeah, for I think Amanda Steer. put that there, yeah. In the in the chat box as well. Yeah. And that is tdem.texas.gov. Okay. What is it for? State of Texas Emergency Assistance Registry. That's a mouthful. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. If we have a pet and the pet is big, are we supposed to have a pet carrier with rolling wheels? Sorry? Are, is, are, are you speaking in regards to like a rescue type thing, uh, Miss Angie? A pet carrier would be if you have to evacuate. And yes. Yeah. Running around loose. So a lot of the shelters will ask that your pet be in a carrier if you're trying okay. to get to a shelter. Okay. Um, when there is no mandatory evacuation like Harvey, the disabled and elderly do not have support. 
So is it recommended that that's when they do the registration? Yes. Okay. Is steer only good during hurricane season? No, I think it's good. You know, it's perpetual a registry. I mean, they have that information if there's flooding, if, you know, tornadoes, because tornadoes just don't limit themselves to hurricane season. Okay, cool. Great deal. Neither do, and neither does flooding. <laughs> Unfortunately, flooding can occur year round in Houston, as we well know. True. And and we always tell folks in our home buyer education class, it's, it's always a good idea if you can afford to get flood insurance, go ahead and get flood insurance because Houston is the Bayou City and it's not a matter of uh, if your area floods, but it's when, because somebody, your area is eventually going to flood at, at some form or fashion at, at, at one point in time. Some areas that, you know, that are not considered even to be in flood zones have flooded in the past. So you just never know. And it's better to have it than not. And in, in, in all cases, when you register for, uh, uh, or when you get flood insurance, and that's something else I wanted to talk about too. When you get flood insurance, are you going to quote for flood insurance because it is issued by the, the government or by FEMA? Your insurance, your, your, that flood insurance policy should be the same cost. Meaning that if you go and get a quote from somebody from flood insurance in one place, and then you go and get a flood insurance quote from somebody else in another place, the cost should be exactly the same for your property. It should not fluctuate. It should not be more in one than versus the other. Yeah, your, your rate is based on your flood risk. Mm -hmm. And since it's through the government, it should be consistent. Exactly. Uh, I'm going back through the chat here to make sure that I'm not missing anybody's questions. Uh, but at any time, if anybody's interested, uh, please feel free to unmute yourself. Ms. Foreman, I see you unmuted yourself. You have a question? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah, so uh, so registering with uh, 211 is only good through her uh, from November the, excuse me, November, from January the 1st until I believe November the 1st or the 2nd, unless something has changed. Uh -huh. They only do that during hurricane season. So my concern uh, since Harvey, what is, you know, what's being provided for seniors uh, and those that are disabled, uh, when your area, there is not a mandatory evacuation that would be during hurricane season. And then for any natural uh, disaster that may happen after, I, d I don't know of any type of coverage uh, that is out there. We have a lot of seniors uh that have home health services and if you read through any of those books that they give you when the elderly are are um, signing up for those services that evacuation plan that they say that has been reviewed with that person or the family basically it's a one-line sentence called 211 that's that that's the preparedness and that doesn't work after hurricane season and it does not work when your area is not uh when there has not been a mandatory evacuation it's not going to mean that you're not going to have uh you know concerns so that you know that's what i'm wanting to direct uh the question inquiry to uh the guests that are on Yep, I don't have an answer for that. Okay. Any have, suggestions of who, my, who I might reach out to? I would suggest contacting uh, the mayor's office to see um, who you should connect with prior to a disaster. They would uh, okay, okay. I, I, I can certainly do that again. I've, I've reached out to the mayor's office for people with disabilities. And so what I was told back then is that uh, there were a lot of meetings that were going to be going on to try to plan a little bit better. And so I, I guess uh, that group of um, population has uh, still been left on the back burner. Uh, Ms. Corbin, there's also a lot of 
most counties have long-term recovery groups. Yeah. Harris so you County might want to, Harris County does for sure. You might want to find, I'm not sure if you're in Harris County, but if you are, Harris County has a long-term recovery and it's kind of most of the, most organizations that have been involved in disaster work for, for a very, very long time. And there's kind of everybody is there. Um, so if you can, you might want to reach out to the long-term recovery and see if there have been any updates on that. Okay. Do you have something to put in the chat regarding regarding long term uh, recovery? Because uh, there's can, a lot of things with that name in it. <laughs> I can okay. I can uh, I can look up the link for you and I'll put it in there. But it, it is it is called the Harris County Long Term Recovery uh, Committee or a group. But I, I can look it up and put it for you. But when you call two one one to register for STEER, or when when other people that you refer to them, they should also still be able to tell you what other organizations are offering those kinds of services as well too, because they have that whole directory or that database of all of these organizations that do different things. So they should be able to tell you too. Absolutely, and as of January the first, you always have to register again for that. And as of this year, twenty twenty two. Uh, I was not able to get that information as mm -hmm. of January of, of, of 2022. And I have done that. It, I have done that every year since Harvey. Because when Harvey came that year, I ended up calling the American Red Cross for some assistance and they could not assist me. They did not even know anything about the announcement that had been made at that time. Um, that the mayor had made uh, regarding people that were non-mobile and end up having to actually go through two other American Red Cross uh, out of state. And they actually called the American Red Cross back down here in Houston and start getting some things done because this was very, this was, uh, you know, had a lot of moving parts. The person was non-mobile. They had to have AMLAMP services. The services, so the AMLAMPs had to get in before the storm got uh, so bad or they wouldn't be able to, to come in to get the person. And then the other thing is that they had to be able to provide a shelter where oxygen, uh, um, um, medical bed, hospital bed, um, uh, air mattress, several things that needed be that needed to, to be provided, but all of this was worked out of out of state at that American Red Cross and transitioned to the American Red Cross. The only thing was missing was the Amalamps transportation, and I thought that that was really ridiculous. As a uh, uh, as big as Houston was, that that information was not uh, available. And of course, you know, everyone saw things on news that was going on. So um, anyway, um, I'm sorry to be so long winded about that, but that is really near and dear to my heart. Um, and <laughs> we, we just don't have a good plan that that's set up for that population. We, we really don't. And so I, I will keep trying to work on this and I will follow through again and I will call the 211 again to see if anything has changed since January of this year. And whatever you find out, if you could let us know. So that way, uh, when I Absolutely. go to send out the link, then I can make sure that I can put a note in there for everybody else. Okay, okay yeah. very well. I okay, and, and the Harris County Long-Term Recovery Committee, they're, they're based out of the United Way. Okay. So I just put their link in the chat as well. Okay. My screen went blank. Okay, here it goes. Thank you so much. All of all of the resources that have been discussed here today, uh, I will be including again uh, all of these links and everything. Um, I've downloaded a, an information sheet about Steer, uh, about Harris County Long Term Recovery, uh, about RSVP, and those links that. Um, that Sapna and Amanda referred to. So all of those will also be included in the, uh, the email. Someone had a question here. Will it help to periodically take pictures of your possessions? Yes. If you're, especially if you're getting insurance, um, if you have things that are especially valuable, if you have things that are unique, you definitely want pictures of those things. 
if you have the ability to get things appraised, you want those done as well so that your insurance company can issue you a policy that covers what you are actually losing. You know, so if you have grandma's china, you want to get grandma's china appraised if you can, right? So your insurance covers the loss of grandma's china, um, plus lots of pictures. And sometimes you have to keep in mind too that the uh, some of those insurance coverages require additional riders. So they're not just automatically covered on your insurance. So if it's like antique stuff or something that you know has great sentiment of value or what have you, some kind of a collection, things that do need to be appraised, they're going to have to have an additional rider added to your insurance. So uh, make sure you definitely ask your insurance agent about that. Uh, Let's see. In addition to the United Way link above, here's kind of, let me see. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Elon uh, Britt also just put in the uh, another link for Harris County Long Term Recovery.org or HCLTCR TRC.org. Did I say that right? hcltrc.org. Getting a little dyslexic looking at these letters. Thank you very much for that. Okay, I think those are all the questions that we had in the chat. And double checking to make sure that I'm not missing anything in the comment section here on Facebook. So. Uh, again, the information that was presented here today will be uh, shared in a link to everyone, um, along with the link of the recording of this session. Uh, if there are any other questions, please feel free to unmute yourself or go ahead and type those into the chat. Um, thank you guys very, very much for presenting this information. Again, we know with the start of hurricane season, uh, this is information that we need to get distributed on a regular basis to as many people as we possibly can and, and share all of the available resources to everyone. So, uh, you know, again, a lot of times folks just don't know where to go to receive this information or who to contact or even how to get started. So, uh, so thank you guys very much. Uh, later on this week or actually starting tomorrow, for those homeowners that don't know about some of the uh, available property tax insurances and the changes that have come up, I'm sorry, property tax exemptions um, that have taken effect as of May the 7th, you guys don't wanna miss that presentation tomorrow from the Harris County Appraisal District and Tax Assessor's Office uh, to talk about property tax exemptions and how they save you money and what those increases have been uh, and what that exactly means for you guys. Also, if there are any homeowners that are still experiencing any type of uh, uh, financial hardship and having uh, difficulties covering their mortgage payments due to the moratorium ending, um, Lone Star actually will be presenting uh, about foreclosure uh, prevention and the uh, what you need to know about the for sale by owner type thing. And I believe Amanda basically, uh, she kind of touched on it on a little bit when she talked about renters that are doing the for sale by owners and protecting your ownership interest. And a lot of folks don't know that, you know, uh, what that process should be like when you're entering into a for sale by owner type of a situation or owner financing or what's the other word that they, what they call it, um, they're called something else. Contract for deed. Uh, contract for deed. That's the thing. So, so they have a couple of different names, but they pretty much all mean the same thing. But you definitely need to know what you have to do to protect your own your home ownership interest and making sure that the person that's trying to do the for sale by owner type of a thing actually are the owners of the property. And you know, there is no existing mortgages and things like that that are currently on that the owner can be foreclosed on. And, you know, again, filing your ownership interest with the county clerk's office and so on and so forth. Otherwise, you're just a regular tenant. You may think that you're buying the house and, you know, you that may not actually also be the case. Uh, are those meetings on NRCDC page? for the Yes, ma'am. Uh, they are. Uh, if you go to nrcdc.org, go to the Get Registered tab, and you will see that information to register for those other, that workshop, as well as the other remaining workshops workshops that we have scheduled for the rest of the month. Um, 
Let's see. And then after our Thursday workshop, our last one for this month is Coffee and Conversation. And that's going to be on Tuesday. And what basically Coffee and Conversation is, it's the City of Houston's uh, Department of Neighborhoods hosts a, uh, a monthly meeting where there are department representatives throughout the City of Houston that are available. Um, there's usually one particular department that's featured that gives you kind of an update on what's going on within that particular department. But it allows people the opportunity to come in and, and ask questions, have their, have their uh, issues or their concerns uh, addressed. Ms. Foreman, if you'd like to show up uh, for the Tuesday Coffee and Conversation to talk about, um, you know, what can be done about, you know, assistance and, and things like that for uh, seniors during the hurricane season, then you may be able to get an answer there as well. So, uh, or even- okay. I don't know if they. I don't know if they have someone that they can direct you from three one one or or what that we don't know about. But please feel free to to come for that. Uh, that's next Tuesday at ten a.m. But that particular meeting allows folks the opportunity to to have their their issues addressed, whether it's um, heavy trash or safety concerns, bike paths, you know, street lights, street signs, whatever it is, uh, stray dogs and whatever else it is that you think that, you know, that is a concern for your particular neighborhood, um, then, then you wanna come to, uh, to talk with those city representatives about that. So um, with that being said, that those are all of the workshops that we have for the remainder of the summer. And uh, we are in the process uh, of, of planning our fall uh, sessions. So following this presentation, you will see the pop-up screen and asking you to complete the brief survey about the month of service presentations and asking that you uh, um, kind of give us your feedback and your input on the workshops that we currently present. If there is some information that we don't currently offer or that you guys may be interested in, then uh, definitely uh, reach out to us and let us know or, or fill out, you know, put that information on your uh, um, on your survey for us. Um, Ms. Kelly with uh, RSVP asked that I send out a survey also in regards to disaster preparedness. So I'll be attaching that to the link in the, uh, with the presentation as well. Um, we definitely appreciate you guys for coming by and um, receiving this information and continuing to support a month of service. Um, Ms. Foreman, I will also include Ms. Kelly's contact information to get that disaster packet or those document bags. Um, and I believe we still have some at our office, but let me double check um, it. because I'm not sure how many that you need or what area that you're in, if you just wanted the document bags or if you needed the entire packet. So um, let us know or let me know about that. Um, with that being said, Sapna, Amanda, Thomas, thank you guys very much. Uh, again, for taking the time out this afternoon to present Thank this information to our participants. Um, we hope that you all have a wonderful day. Um, we see the names of all of these people here, but never see the faces. But I do see Ms. Grace is on, um, Ms. Jackson is on. Thank you guys very much. Hi, Ms. Donna, how are you? Folks, I, you'd be surprised that I, I recognize the names of these people but I, I've never met any of them in person, but we, we certainly thank you guys for coming back and, and joining and participating and supporting a month of service. Thank you guys very much. Ms. Foreman, we hope to see you on Tuesday. Uh, where are previous meetings recorded? We send out links to all of our previous meeting sessions. Uh, however, we are starting to do all of our uh, recordings or all of our meetings on Facebook Live. So if you go to Amos Houston TX, you'll be able to see all of the links of the recordings of all the meetings that we do live there. However, we also are going to are creating our YouTube channel. So, uh, so look for uh, Amos Houston to come to YouTube pretty soon that has all of our recordings on there as well. So. Um, okay, good information. All right. You are so very welcome. Thank you guys very much. And we hope you all have a wonderful remainder of your day. Continue to stay safe, take care of yourselves, stay cool out there. It's supposed to be like a hundred degrees coming up these next several days. And, you know, I'm just not ready because it's not even July yet. And I, I don't know what to say about that. So, except I keep getting these notifications from Centerpoint about power outages and what's, you know, potential surges and all this other kinds of stuff coming up. But, you know, who knows? All right.
that's about it. So thank you guys very much. You all have a wonderful day. Be safe. All right, you too.